Okay, thank you, Thierry. Uh, my name is Matthew Stubitz, I come from Technologia Serbia. And uh, as a work package leader of, of the work package directed to electrodactyl interfaces, my presentation will be directed to, well, electrodactyl stimulation in general, uh, because idea is not to get too technical, but to give more as an overview to the general public and to, to the stakeholders of what are the key technologies in the projects we are developing. So I will speak a little bit about electrical stimulation, about the principles of electrical stimulation, about what are the advantages of this approach, and also a little bit of where we are currently within the activity project. So Eric, yes, please go ahead. So first thing that I wanted to outline is that the history of uh, electrotactile communication can stretch all the way, all the way back, if we think technologically wise, to the electric chair. The 1990, of course, then the feedback was very rudimental. It was uh, you will live or you will not live. Okay, joking aside, uh, uh, we advanced quite, quite much uh, as a society on this level of basically, uh, well, also as, you know, like uh, uh, not having this capital punishment is something that is uh, normal, but we also advance technologically wise. So, uh, will you switch, so let's say, uh, please, please, yes. So, so well, we also considered how we can actually use this for helping people. And the first things uh, that came to mind is basically to use this type of tactile communication to present information to the blind people and also to the people that uh, are basically uh, amputees, that they don't have the, uh, that are missing certain limbs to provide feedback from the mechanical devices that they, they use to, to, to basically uh, grasp objects and things like this. But then after this, uh, Jerry, please. <laughs> okay, I would have a lot Shout of- Shout at me. <laughs> yes, I would have a lot of transitions, so yeah, this would, this would take time, but okay. But then after time, you know, like uh, looking at this evolution from the 70s, from this uh, ba basic rudimental use of this technology to provide the, some information to the people who have these disadvantages that they didn't have other means of communication, we advanced, advanced quite a lot. So now you can see also from 2014, you can see that this is now very much integrated, that we can consider this type of devices as uh, integrated in the, into some type of mobile phones and also some type of grasping interfaces, like you can see this whole, whole hand haptic interface. So uh, a lot of developments on this side. I will not go into the differences in terms of communication and what type of feedback is offered through these different devices, but uh, I just wanted to outline that uh, this has been used in the past. It's, it's not novel, but I think that currently we are in a situation that this is no longer only used for 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 uh, providing feedback to the people that actually uh, well that where this is used as compensation for the loss of sight or loss of limb or but this is now actually technology is more at the moment that we can consider this that it can be actually massively used as an uh, additional means of, of of telling something to the healthy people and for consumers electronics in general and this is what the quality project is about so there is uh, to explain the principle uh, of electrical stimulation in general, ah, yes, a little bit of pointing. Uh, you can see that, for instance, uh, this is like very basic. When you consider that uh, we, if you would have two electrodes that are positioned over a certain nerve, for this example, this is like efferent nerve going to the muscle, if we deliver sufficient charge, this will cause the depolarization of this uh, nerve. And basically, the, the charge will be delivered then, or, or the information will be delivered to the muscle, and the muscle will contract. And this has been used a lot in the past. I will not go into the, the, the other neurorehabilitation applications, but this is, let's say, the basic uh, idea of how this principle works. When we think about uh, using this not for, for um, depolarization of efferent nerves, but of afferents, then we get to a little bit more complex the situation because, of course, there are different types of cells that are distributed in the skin that are uh, serving as the receptors for different type of uh, tactile sensations. So for pressure, vibration, shear deformation, high frequency vibrations, there are different types of cells of different depths. And then this becomes a little bit more complicated. There is also the another question of how this uh, current is flowing because then this can be a cathodic or anodic stimulation and then uh, this will also dictate how, how, how you are depolarizing the nerves. But more or less why I wanted to outline this 
even though the principle is quite simple, what is where is the issue is that uh, how we are actually using this, we are using this superficially. So basically, if we were to go directly to the nerve, this would be easy. But if we are doing this through the skin, then we need to have the means to, to really control how the, uh, how the current distribution will go and how we will uh, activate different nerves. So especially if we're speaking about these specific cells, if we want to activate different type of tactile sensations, then this is something that we need to have very nice control of the of the of the current flow. Uh, okay, this works. That's good. Uh, so, uh, speaking about uh, how we are using this and what is the, the technological advantage that technology is offering, is uh, we see the basics of this in spatial temporal distribution of pulses. So basically, this would be a conventional method. You have a very large electrode that you place over skin, and then you deliver pulses. But in this uh, principle that is well now technically patented, uh, we, we are using something that considers multiplexing of pulses in one uh, period of stimulation. So, for instance, if we multiplex these pulses, we can uh, activate multiple pairs. And if this stimulation period is, let's say, small enough, this will be perceived as the same sensation. So basically, we can dictate the shape of the electrode, which is very much important if we consider the challenge that I mentioned, the challenge is basically depolarizing specific nerves or specific receptors. And then, okay. I don't uh, work on <laughs> Are you a messy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this works. Okay, it's good to know. Uh, well, uh, how, how this works basically is that we have this multiplexing unit, this, the, the, this uh, uh, device that uh, is controlling the, the distribution of pulses or something that we consider this multiped electrode that is placed on the skin. So very important part is design of this and very important part is that this unit or this device is intelligent that it knows how you are controlling this and where you want passes to be delivered. Uh, I will not go into too much details about uh, how this electronically works, but important part is that uh, in, uh, we are able to, through this, this theory, okay, now we will have slow pressing. Uh, through this, we are able to uh, achieve much higher number of the output channels than what you could do with the conventional uh, approach. Then with this, if you consider uh, alternative approach where you need a separate uh, outputs for, for, for multiple, uh, multiple points of stimulation, uh, this allows us uh, to have a miniature device. So this spatial temporal or uh, multiplexing approach allows us to, to minimize the size of the device, to make it wearable. And then also what is important is that uh, with this intelligence of the, the, or with the control of the autos, we can pre-program some algorithms inside of our device, which gives us a lot of flexibility in how this will be working temporarily. One more. And what is also very much relevant, and I'm not going to too much with the details, is that this, this allows us to make uh, closed loop systems. So, for instance, we can integrate uh, uh, the tactile stimulator with something that would measure, for instance, EMG or EEG. So, we can make closed loop devices that can act based on these inputs to, to provide outputs. And one more, okay, just to, to mention all of these things were basically published a long time ago just the principle, but then how this can be used for electroductive stimulation, and then also how this closed loop system works, how this is, how much this is important when we consider that uh, in EMG you would need to record the data at the same time, etc. Next. And okay, now how we in Technalia exploited this, or how we, uh, what are the approaches that where we see that uh, this can be used this uh, for electroductive. Uh, information sharing. Well, first approach was well, basically something that is. Can you press one more to see? If, yeah, the video is good. Uh, uh, we use this to convey information to the to the amputees. This is like you saw from the from the background from the literature. It was something that first comes to mind. So what we offer to the Maxen system is this integrated uh, band that has a lot of electrodes and that then our uh, participants where we tested this. Uh, actually proved that this can be uh, used to provide uh, uh, or to code meaningful information that they can understand the state of the prosthesis, so the, how the prosthesis is moving, whether it's rotating, closing, opening, and also the force that it's applying uh, 
uh, and that they can learn this very quickly, which is very much important when you consider use of the systems. But now we have actually three, three additional, and we will speak about fertility more later, but uh, three additional uh, ongoing EU projects where this is exploited. I will just mention them. One is Sixth Sense, when we are using the same type of tactile communication pro to provide mission critical information to first responders. So basically, you can imagine that uh, when you have this type of uh, action from from from, uh, from 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 a team of well, it can be military, but in this specific case, it's first responders, uh, that they uh, when their other senses, their visual and auditory, are already basically used for the activity they are having. If you want them to 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 provide them additional means of feedback, this is a very good approach. Uh, then we have also. Something that is very close to the max sense in terms of the design, in terms of the use, is to, to provide the feedback through the third arm, to, to provide the feedback to, to, to well, to, uh, to provide additional means of feedback that allows, for instance, here you can see in laparoscopic surgery, if you have somebody who is basically, or the operator who is uh, using both arms, but he should be able to also identify how the robot, additional robotic arm is being used. This also very much with aligned with what we have uh, in uh, tactility project as a telemanipulation scenario, and you will hear a, a little bit later more about this. And the last thing to mention is that there is also advancements of technology. This was one of the projects that actually ended recently. But for instance, in this project, we indented in the workers projects, we, we um, identified how basically this can be even more integrated. So I spoke about the core technology. Core technology is this dim dim multiplexing. So having the intelligence to, to, to distribute these pulses. In this project, we, we, we re researched how this can be actually embedded into the iCloud, which is also very much important. OK, so uh, one thing, like I said at the beginning, I will speak a little bit about what are the principles, but then I will speak a little bit what are the advantages of the technology that we are offering into electrotactile stimulation. Main, uh, let's say, competitor in terms of, of, of uh, providing this type of uh, tactile feedback is vibrotactile stimulation. And here you see some, some of the examples of the comparisons. Clearly, the biggest advantage is that with electrotactile stimulation, you can have the, the uh, well, you can minimize the, 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 the size of the device and you can make something that is much more integrated. So you can provide higher density of information. With fiber tactile, with these uh, tactors, they are quite large. I mean, they, they take much more space than the electrode. Electrode is printed. It can be very much integrated. You see here, for instance, this, this type of fiber tactile vest. I mean, they are taking a lot of space. If you compare how, how this electrode looks like, it's something that you can just stick on the body, so it's much, much smaller. Other thing is that with uh, electrodes, uh, they are produced by uh, screen printing. So actually, you can come to any design that you think is appropriate, and it can be, uh, uh, well, it can be produced in a way that it's optimized to the, to the needs. So it's here you can see how this electrode looks, for instance, in this Maxence project. Here is the electrode for the NEMO project, and here is the electrode from the Sixth Sense project. All are exactly adapted to the applications and the need. With vibro motors, of course, you can integrate them into the into the vest, or place them on the leg, or place them on the arm. But it's much more difficult to to have this uh, adapted to the application. And one more, oh sorry, Terry, one more important thing uh, in comparison with uh, vibro motors is that ele electrical stimulation allows you to to control the uh, or, to, or to modulate also different aspects of the uh, stimulation that you are delivering. So you can actually not only play with amplitude or the frequency, how it is in vibro stimulation, but you can actually uh, modulate this in the, independently. So you can you can change both the amplitude and the frequency and the pulse width. So all these parameters of stimulation is something that you can dictate and that will actually result in with different sensations in the end. And now we're coming to tactility projects and the requirements that we had and why we thought that this is basically the most uh, appropriate approach. Uh, the, this is something where, for instance, in the tactility, we considered how we, we can integrate this into something that is in a form of a glove. So for virtual reality to allow a person to, to basically also feel the world, we consider that integrating into the kinematic glove also this type of electrotactile electrodes uh, and allow, allow, allowing them to feel 
the, the, uh, when, when objects are being grasped, when something is moving. This is something that was uh, much appropriate for the, for the uh, technology we have, because for instance, with these fiber motors, you would never be able to provide the number of points that you need in the end. So in the two use cases that we identified, one is the VR use case. So it's basically, uh, let's say, a local use case. There is a, a head mounted display, and then you have this kinematic glove, and then you are able actually to touch something that is in the virtual scene. But there is another use case that we also identified that is quite similar, but still different. It's the manipulation scenario. It means that actually you have a robotic device that is distant, and then you have this tactile glove that you can use actually to feel what this robotic device is doing. And you will hear more about these two scenarios later. But uh, what is uh, combined from the means, uh, from the uh, well, requirements of the tactile stimulation is that we want, wanted to have high density uh, uh, gloss with high density electrodes distributed over the palm of the hand. Of course, requirements were a little bit different for the scenarios depending on, on what is the need, what the, what the robotic device, how the robotic device is being operated, and what is the information from the uh, virtual reality scenario that we want to convey. But more or less, this was the, the, the same requirement. It's basically to have a lot of pads distributed over the hand. Then the other uh, part uh, is that we, of course, needed to have low intensity pulses because we are speaking about producing very uh, subtle sensations of touching and being able to modulate them. And then, of course, uh, because these pads are very small, the, small, the requirements of voltage on the other hand are quite high. We wanted to have variable and compact device. And what was very much important is also to allow real-time communication. So the, what this device needed to be something that can basically communicate in real time or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and that can work in the closed loop or environment with this virtual reality uh, device or with this uh, time manipulation uh, robotic device. And uh, one more requirement that we had also was to, to integrate in the system estimation of impedance because this is this was very much needed to allow uh, the to uh, compensate or to identify the movements, to identify the, any changes because of course clearly with the glass we wanted to allow subjects to move their hands and to really uh, we, we needed to be technologically able to adapt to all these all these things. Okay, so this is actually what we achieved so far in terms of this device. I spoke about the requirements, and you can see how much, of course, uh, like I said, we we uh, Technalia from the long time was developing uh, uh, electrical stimulation devices, but the requirements for this projects uh, project were, let's say, in this way special that we needed to uh, minimize the, the size of the device, we wanted to make it wearable, but at the same time we wanted to increase the number of channels to uh, compare to what we are usually doing. And uh, I believe that we, we achieved quite a lot. So, so the current version of the device is quite small, quite compact, you will see it and uh, hopefully also some of you will be able to test it during demos. But uh, this is the, something that we fulfilled. But what is also important is that the device integrates this uh, means of control of all the parameters that are needed, but most importantly, the uh, very precise control of amplitude of stimulation. This was one of the requirements because we wanted to allow, uh, well, really fi fine tuning of the sensations that will be elicited. And uh, you can see how this looks now. I think it's uh, already very compact, very nice device that is uh, when integrated with this first prototype of the globe, you can see what is the potential. So we are very close to making something that can be considered uh, for uh, as a consumer electronic of, of, of use for uh, for any type of, uh, um, well, for any type of different virtual reality scenarios. And uh, throughout this, what we have been uh, investigating, of course, this didn't, this didn't come easy. There are many challenges that we faced, uh, and also there were many research parts that we needed to do to come where we are. For instance, one part where we started was uh, to, to really identify how these electrodes can look like how the electrodes need to be designed that we can really control these sensations and to, to uh, at the same time, we wanted to be sure that uh, these sensations will be really uh, different, that we can provoke all these different characteristics. 
that are of need for specific scenarios. So you can see that we had different designs that we tested initially, but then we moved to something that is more integrated. You can see we first identify how the sensations feel like just on the fingertips, but then we uh, on the, in the second uh, iteration, we provide uh, we, we, we well research the electrodes that cover the complete fingers. In the end, to come to something that is really designed for the complete hand. Basically, with this, we identified how far we can go with resolution, how many points we can have on specific uh, parts of the hand, and then based on this knowledge, we designed the electrodes. In in the end, we came here next uh, to the final design that you can see it has. <laughs> basically merges everything that we have done previously. It has this high density part that is covering the fingertips. It has this differently different distributed electrodes around the, around the palm. And there is also this common anode in the center so that we have something that is very much integrated. One more thing to, to comment, yes, is that this is the, uh, this is of course part of this research is how we can integrate this, how we can make this wearable, how, make it, uh, how we will basically address that we can have easy uh, toning and doffing of this system. Clearly, we want this to be something that is as much integrated as possible. So part of this was integration into the textile. Uh, press one more thing because I think this is a video, yes. So the, 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 the first with the simple electrodes, we tried to, to investigate different substrates that we can use, different methodologies of how we can really laminate this onto the textile, how we can make it robust enough. And you can see that throughout this research, we provided, uh, well, let's say, different type of, uh, of uh, designs and different type of approaches. But in the end, what we also managed to achieve is to have this electrode stretchable, washable, and integrated onto the, the textile. So this is where we are now. And Terry, please, once more. You can see this is the current prototype that uh, we will be able to test later. It consists of two parts. One is the electrode uh, or the glove that goes to the uh, to the palm, and the other is this, let's say, hand caps that go all over to, 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 to be present on the fingertips. The reasoning for us dividing this is to allow different use cases. So maybe not complete electrode is needed for not all the uh, parts are needed in all the applications. So one part can be used or the other might be used depending on the specific virtual realities or telemanipulation scenario. And what is important, as you saw in the previous design, this now integrates 64 different points and they are distributed, well, to the best of our knowledge, to the best of the research that we have done so far, distributed in the uh, best manner to cover the most sensitive areas and the areas that are intended for, for specific applications. So here you can see a little bit about process, how this, this is being done. Uh, this allowed us to, to, to come to the point that we have something that is now basically a globe that has all this inside. Okay. Yes. Now I will speak a little bit because I said <laughs> I will speak about advantages and I mentioned what are the advantages of the electrodactyl stimulation in comparison to vibrodactyl. It wouldn't be fair not to come across what is the, let's say, major disadvantage in comparison to this, uh, to the vibrotactyl, and it's related to the, it's related to the calibration and the, 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 well, the need for each specific point to, to be calibrated to the amplitude that will evoke a sensation that is clear, but that is not un unpleasant. And uh, what, how we are solving this, how we approach this is basically through research to come across to identify basically what is the useful range that we can uh, use of amplitudes for this specific design of the electrodes for these specific locations. And here you see some of the results that we have done. I will not go into the details because I was also asked not to go too much into the, <laughs> the technological and, and, and the research outputs. But uh, what is important to outline is that uh, through the research that we have done, we have really identified the, uh, what is the useful range of amplitudes. So we know where, where, where the sensation thresholds and that this is basically grouping. And then in comparison to this, where, where, where we have discomfort. So you can see that there is clearly a range that we can use and that will provoke something that uh, are meaningful sensations that are not unpleasant and that the subjects can differentiate. Uh, please, next slide. Here you can see also the study that we have done to really prove that this, this we can consider the useful range in a sense that 
uh, whatever amplitude that you will use in this range, you will evoke, uh, uh, or actually you will be able to produce uh, the same level of uh, localized stimuli. So you will not go into the saturation of what 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 the subject will perceive. But in that, uh, by uh, enlarging the amplitude, you will still reach the level where where the subjects uh, will be able to in, have the high success rate in recognizing the exact location of stimuli. Uh, one more thing related to the calibration also to outline is related to the to the fact that as you saw our, our electrodes has many points they are distributed on all the different parts of the palm and the fingers and uh, there is also this spatial mapping so this was part of our research to really understand how the finger ticks are uh, behaving in comparison to the palm how the sizes of the electrodes are influencing this as well. So we, we knew this from the, before. We had one uh, study from the Maxens that shows that basically uh, we can use this uh, spatial redistribution of the electrode or the design of the electrode to identify prior to, to the uh, prior to the use what would be the use uh, what would be the distribution of the amplitudes on different locations. So this can be embedded into the cal calibration algorithm, and the algorithm can be also minimized in this way. So there are two. Two things. One is the things that I out, out, the thing that I outlined previously is that there is a range that you can use. But the other thing is that you can have prior knowledge of the distribution of this, so you can basically minimize the procedure by knowing these two facts and by by using a minimal number of pairs. Because if you would like to use the electrode with 64 uh, points to calibrate each of them, that would be a hassle. So the part of our research was in this identifying the mapping. How, how these percentages, when you calibrate certain pads, how the other pads, what, what is the expected amplitude on the other pads, and we can use this prior knowledge to minimize the procedure. And with this, we have also can uh, come to the specific uh, uh, calibration algorithm that can be used for, 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 for the needs of tactility, where when you consider this for the version 5 of, of, of the electrode or the previous version of the glow, but now it's very similar for what, what we have now, and you will see that later during the during the workshop in the demos. But the idea is that actually we, we can use the two-step calibration algorithm. So this prior knowledge is embedded in this algorithm, meaning that we selected specific reference paths that you need to calibrate. You calibrate this pad, and then automatic distribution of the amplitude is set to the rest remaining pads based on this prior knowledge, based on the, on the experiments that we have done. We can already uh, distribute the, 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 the levels for all the other points. And we have one reference pad on the palm and one on uh, or three on uh, distributed over the fingers that we can use to set all the points prior to the use. So this is minimizing the procedure and allowing us to, to, to really use the system. Uh, one more thing to outline is, of course, uh, with this type of electrotactile inter interface, you need to, to allow a subject also to, to, to have this ability to tweak specific sensations. So there is this second step in the algorithm, which allows us basically afterwards the subject to test the stimulation on all the points and to adjust where needed. Usually it is not needed, but of course this needs to be added as a, as a measure for the very start as a, a precaution. Uh, this, okay, here next, next is the final slide. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for your attention and I want to ask you if you have any questions that are related to, to this story of the electrotactile interface. It was more related to the system, the hardware of the system that we're using. Uh, next talk will be from Strachiniak. He will speak more about the sensations that will be that can be elicited throughout this system. But uh, if you have any questions that are related to the system and the uh, electrodes and the design that we are using, please, um, I can we ask you to raise them now. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mattia, for this uh, insight into the hardware, hardware developments in in the project. And also your introduction, I mean, to see a little bit the history and so <laughs> about that tactile stimulation. So are there any questions from the audience? Um, please, those that are um, linked through Teams, uh, put it into the chat, your, your questions. I think you should have access to the chat. Are there any questions? So I don't see raised hands. Of course, I have always a question yes, <laughs> for you. Good. So, uh, I mean, 
when, when you look from the technological side, uh, we have still a number of, of challenges, uh, I think. Which challenge do you consider as the uh, most uh, important or relevant at the current stage of the project? Well, I, I, I think that uh, calibration is always an issue. I think that, uh, I mean, this depends on the, on the final use of the system, but I believe that uh, if we consider this um, consumer device, so, so something that, that should be easily used, not necessarily that this glove is used for VR gaming, but also why not? So, so, so the idea is that the uh, user will be able to adapt to this technology rather quickly. Uh, the challenge is that electrical stimulation is something that uh, takes a little bit time for, for, for somebody to get used to, to get used to the sensations and to really be able to uh, localize the stimuli because this is, uh, let's say, new uh, channel of information. It's something that uh, takes time to adapt to. So in this sense, we, we should try to minimize the time, this adaptation time for the user. So for instance, uh, one part is this calibration. So mm -hmm. for the first use, we need to allow subject to, to really be able to set it up in a few minutes. I think that the calibration algorithm that we have now are, uh, well, let's see, good starting point, but still there are many challenges ahead. But the other part is also, for instance, uh, the, the scenario, VR scenario or the telemanipulation scenario should consider including steps or increasing the, 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 the number of the feedback channels in time. So first to allow something that is rudimental that the user can really connect and understand and then uh, slowly increasing the number of channels or the number of information or, or uh, the bandwidth of information that is being transmitted to the subject. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that it might take time for people to get used to the sensations. Could you just make that a little bit, a little bit more concrete is that 10 times, is that a week's worth or what, what kind of? Well, I would say it would take one Not session yet. of, uh, yes. Can you repeat the question a bit Please. louder so that? So the, the, the question was, uh, what, what, what is the expected time for the user to, to get used to this type of sensation that is elicited through electrical stimuli? I would say that the first use, so the first time it's put on, it seems a little bit strange. It's not something that is, I think that with vibromotors you feel vibrations, but there are, of course, with this, there is additional challenge that this is something that is uh, very, very much like uh, uh, movement artifacts. So for instance, uh, there is a challenge with using uh, vibromotors when, when this is uh, also movement of, of the subject. With electrical stimulation, this is very much different. The sensation is, uh, first studies that we have done were to really, uh, well, let's say, depict how the user will perceive this. And in the end, uh, we came to conclusion, although some, some said this is more like tickling, tingling, vibrations, there is a whole, whole range of this. It's not very repeatable. <laughs> Let's say every subject has its own explanation of this sensation, but in the end, end we came to the conclusion that uh, users tend to ex explain this. It's like a, a feeling electrical pulse. So in the end, it's really specific type of sensation, right? So in this sense, uh, I think that uh, person that never tried it needs to experience it first to, to be able to, to really understand it and appreciate it. And then uh, I think that after one session of 10 minutes, you already reached this level that you can, you, you, that you are aware about this, this is the type of uh, feedback that I will receive. But then I think that also there is another challenge, it's about communication, about how many of these channels we will use for the subject really to appreciate this additional or to understand all this information that's given through this additional child challenge, this takes uh, this additional channel, this takes time and this is a challenge that we also need to consider how we will approach. Okay. Okay, any other question? Yes, there is one in the back, yes. One question about uh, we were discussing earlier differences and similarities with vibro tactile and, and electric tactile. Yes. Uh, one of the issues with uh, electric tactile, vibro tactile over extended periods of time is the fatigue of different, different receptors. Yes. So typically, those who so, uh, suffer also yes. over time. How does that compare here? Do you get better resilience or fatigue from 
Or... Yes, uh, okay, the question was related now to, to basically the habituation that happens when using this type of tactile uh, communication channels like vibrotactile and electrotactile and what is the difference. Uh, I believe that with electrotactile, what is the advantage is that you can really modulate the sensations so you can change them and you can adapt to this habituation. With vibrotactile, you don't have this means of changing the pulses, changing the frequency of stimulation, changing all, all of these parameters. You can still elicit, uh, elicit electrotactile uh, 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 sensation by, 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 by slight modulation of these parameters, you are able to overcome the habituation. With vibrotactile, you don't have so many uh, means of, of, of adapting. Okay, so thank you again, Matia, for your introduction.